Greetings. My name is Terry Covey, and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you, and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you, and have a great day. We're going to start a, start a new series of messages this morning, studies called about the life of Joseph. And the title probably of today's message would be, Is God Really in Control? And it's going to take quite a while for us to get through the life of Joseph. We'll be probably through the summer, maybe into early fall or something like that because there's so much to study about his life. And it's such a rich life. It covers almost a third of the book of Genesis when you study about Joseph. And the thing that I was thinking as I was thinking about my message coming up here this morning and starting this, and I was listening to the words of Jennifer's song and about, I, don't, I can't remember the exact phrase about we, something messes and God hears a, yeah, about the, the messes, that part came out in my mind, you know, hearing that. And I thought, aren't you glad to know that we serve a God that is real? And by that, I don't just mean that he really exists, but I mean that he's real. That, that he's not just somewhere so far away from us that he doesn't understand what our life is like. Matter of fact, Jesus, you know, here in the Bible says he, he suffered in all the ways that we suffered. God understands who we are. He under, and probably more than we realize that he does. Uh, we sometimes have a tendency to approach God in this religious kind of way, religious language and all this kind of stuff. And the truth of the matter is, God says, you know, one of my favorite verses, the Bible says, God says, He remembers that our frame is but dust. In other words, He remembers that we're, He just made us out of the dust of the ground. We don't really impress God. The only, I, probably the only way that we're going to impress God is to show Him how much we de are dependent upon Him, isn't it? That's really what He wants. He wants us, when Jesus taught His disciples how to pray, He said, guys, you need to address Him as what? most molest, you know, majestic celestial being of the universe. No, what did Jesus say? Our Father. You're a child. If you know Him as your Savior, you're a child and He is your Father and He understands your frailties. As a matter of fact, as we're going to see through the book of, uh, the book of Genesis as we study about the life of Joseph, not only does He understand what you're going through, oftentimes He orchestrates it. He's right there. You, you ask... Sometimes you ask, why then is this happening? I can't give you all the reasons, but I'll tell you part of the reason is because he wants to draw you closer to himself. And so he uses pain, he uses suffering, he uses difficulty because if he just gave us everything, we'd be spoiled children. He has to work in our life in such a way to remind us periodically that he's, he's God and we're not and we're, the, we're a child and that we need him, and he wants that kind of relationship with him. One of the quotes that I've read about Joseph, it says, Joseph's life proves to us that God is always at work in our lives, even in the insignificant, the obscure, and sometimes difficult details of day-to-day -day living. There's nothing too large to talk to God about. There's nothing too small to talk to God about. The Bible says he doesn't want you to be worried about any single detail of your life, but to pray to him. You say, but he's not concerned about this. Friend, he knows how many hairs are on your head right now. There's nothing about your life that God does not already know. And what he wants, he doesn't want people independent of him. He wants people that are dependent upon him. And we're going to see that through the life of Joseph. Who was Joseph? There are several Josephs mentioned in the Bible, and so... Today is just kind of an introductory kind of lesson, and then I think you'll see the, the, the underlying principle in this lesson, but who was Joseph? There's several Josephs in the Bible. And so I prepared some slides here to kind of give you a little bit, if you're into genealogy, you'll like this, but to kind of give you a brief idea of who, the, who it is that we're talking about, because I want you, my goal is, is that when we finish this series of studies on the life of Joseph, you're going to know so much about Joseph that it's unreal. That you just want, wow, I mean, you're going to go to work and tell people about Joseph. Of course, all of us, we know that everything began with Adam and Eve. And then God gave Adam and Eve two sons. The oldest son was Cain, and then he had a brother named Abel. 
These little boxes right here, if you're familiar with genealogy, these little bo boxes represent descendants. Now, Cain had more than just four descendants, but I'm just kind of making them smaller boxes, no names, to help you understand this. You don't see any boxes under the name of Abel. Why is that? Cain killed Abel. Abel was the first martyr for the cause of God, for righteousness. He was persecuted for righteousness' sake. And he died probably as a teenager. Maybe, well, he had not yet married and not yet had children. So he's still a very young man. But in Hebrews chapter 11, the very first person that is mentioned is Abel and his faith in God. Then after Cain slew Abel, Adam and Eve had another son by the name of Seth. And Seth began to start having children. And he had more than just two descendants before you get to Noah. Probably there's about six or seven generations in between there. But then the most the person that you're most familiar with then after Seth is Noah. And we know that Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, Cain's descendants are going to come to about right here and they're going to end. Why is that? Oh, the flood. They didn't, the only people that survived, so you're, you're a descendant of Noah. Because the only people that survived the flood was Noah and his three sons and their three wives, those eight individuals. So Cain's line was, was wiped off the face of the earth with the flood. Only through Seth's line, only through Noah. Then Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. These three sons then, after they came off of the ark, began to migrate out into the world. You are a descendant of Japheth. Japheth he descended up into, he went, you know, Turkey, roughly where Turkey is, and Mount Ararat is where the ark landed then on the mountain after the end of the flood. And Japheth and his descendants began to descend up north. They went into the area of Russia and over into Europe and things like that. And, of course, most of us are European descent, so you are a descendant of Japheth. Ham, one of the other sons, went, instead of going north, he went south and he migrated, I'm kind of pretending like there's a map here. He kind of migrated down through the Canaanites, the Philistines that you study about in the, in, in the Old Testament. They are descendants of Ham. The Philistines are descendants of Ham. And then his descendants began to kept on migrating into Egypt and eventually down into Africa. Then Shem, the other son, many believe Shem was actually the oldest. Shem then began, we are descendants of Japheth. But through Shem is going to come the Lord Jesus Christ. Another word here for Shem, sometimes we hear the word Semitic. If we hear that someone is anti-Semitic, what does that mean? What is that saying? They're against, primarily Jews, they're against Semitic type. Shem's descendants are called Semitic type people. That's derived from his name. He had several descendants till eventually he had a son by the name of Terah. Michelle, if you'll bring up the next slide now. Now, Terah, now you've got all kinds of descendants out here in the world. Terah, and that's the man, I remember one day my granddad, I was helping him work in the garden, and he said, your name comes from the Bible. And I said, really? And he said, well, your name probably comes from Terah. I don't think that's so, but I remember that. I was a little boy, and that's the impression that he made on me when he told me that. He remember him saying that Terah was the father of Abraham, and only Abraham I knew had a beard, you know, Abraham Lincoln. But Terah then had, he actually had several. He had three sons and a daughter or two. And one of his sons was by the name of Abram. And you know that Abram's name eventually is going to be changed to what? Abraham. And God called Abraham, Abram, to come out of a place called Ur of Chaldees or come out of this region and probably is where Babylon is today and in that area where our troops are fighting. And he migrated over into the promised land that we now speak of today. Abram then, he became a very old man. And what's, what, was, what did it look like was going to happen with Abram and his descendants? He's not going to have any. He's a very old man and he's still not had any children. I was listening the other night to a message by Vernon McGee on this. And I never thought about this in this way. Vernon McGee was talking about the virgin birth of Christ, and he was teaching on that. And then he was talking about the miracle of Isaac that was born to Abraham because Sarah, if I'm not mistaken, was 90 years old. And the book of Romans says that, that her womb, if you was, was dead. Menopause, she had stopped producing 
she stopped having the eggs. And so really, to have a child at 90 years old, is I never thought about it in that way. Just the miracle of that, that God planted that, that egg within her then to be conceived into a child. But Abraham's not able to have, a, have any children, so he has a son by a, a handmaid, by a servant, who actually was an Egyptian. Her name was Hagar, and they named the son Ishmael. I was reading on the internet about this, and even the Muslims themselves say that they are descendants from Ishmael. The Muslims consider Abraham to be their father. The Muslims believe in Abraham. They believe in Isaac. They believe in many of the things that we believe in the Old Testament. They just do not believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. But God said, no, you're not going to carry out my plan through this son Ishmael. You are going to have a son by Sarah, and you're going to name his name Isaac. By the way, what does the name Isaac mean? <laughs> Laughter. Isn't that a good name for a child? Laughter. I'm sure there was a grin on their face, 100 years old and 90 years old. To have a child, Isaac, here, okay? And then Isaac has two sons. They're twin boys. They're, they are not actually identical twins. They're just twins by, by birth there. Esau is the first one that was born, and Jacob is the second one that is born twin boys. We're going to study more about them in the next, Jacob. We're going to study about him over the next few weeks because you can't understand Joseph, really. And you can't understand Joseph's brothers until you begin to understand who Jacob was and what God had to do in Jacob's life in order to be able to raise a son like Joseph. Later, Jacob's name, we'll probably look at that, was named, changed to Israel. So that's why we, that's where the name, a prince with God what that name actually means. Then Jacob had how many sons? Twelve. Those twelve sons of Jacob or Israel become then what we call the twelve tribes of Israel. Jacob, after he swindled his brother Esau out of the birthright and he deceived his dad, Jacob had to flee because Esau was ready. Esau was a hunter. He was a rough kind of guy. He was ready to kill Jacob. And so Jacob had to flee, and he went back to the place where Abraham was actually originally from. And he marries one of his, his uh, part of his family, a descendant there from Abraham as well. He, he goes back to there, and he, he falls in love with a girl, and her name is what? Rachel. He falls in love with Rachel. And so he asks his uncle, he says, what would I have to do that you would let me marry Rachel? He says, well, I think a pretty good deal would be you'd serve me for seven years. And so he worked for seven years, and he went through, and he had the wedding night, and then when he woke up the next morning, who had he actually married? His sister, Leah, who was the older sister. Poor old Leah gets a bad rap. But then he, then he, he, he worked for seven years for Rachel. He wound up marrying Leah. Must have been some wedding party. He wound up marrying Leah, and then he served seven more years so that he could marry Rachel. He worked 14 years for her. He must have really loved her. Well, he loved Rachel the most, and I'm teaching you some things along the way if you're picking up on this, some things that you got. I'm trying to make it real for you to understand. These, these are real people. Our God's a real God, and these are real people. They're situations, okay? So, he, he, wants, he starts having family. He's got two wives, okay? And R Rachel is not able to have any children, and so he first starts having sons by Leah. And he has four sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. It's the first four sons. Well, Rachel, she's really upset over this because it was really a shame for her to not be able to have a child. And so she gives to to Israel or to Jacob, her husband, she takes him, tells him to take her handmaid, Bilhah, and have children. And so I'm trying to even represent by the colors here the association blue and blue. And this, it doesn't show up well, but kind of, it's kind of a burgundy, if you will. And so Leah has the four sons by, by, uh, or by Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Then Jacob has two more sons, Dan, and Naphtali by Bilhah. And then Leah's like, well, wait a minute, I can't let my sister outdo me. And so then she gives to Jacob her handmaid, Zilpha, 
And then so he has two more sons, Gad and Asher by Zilpha. And then Leah has two more sons, poor Rachel at this point, Issachar and Zebulon. And then finally God blesses Rachel. He opens up her womb because God had a special plan and she has two sons, Joseph that we're going to study about and his brother Benjamin. And something I want to really point out to you, of these four women and these 12 sons, of these four women that Jacob fathered children by, which woman did he actually really love? Rachel. He actually loved Rachel. Therefore, which sons is he probably actually going to love? Rachel's sons, Joseph. That's significant. And we'll see more in that next week and the week after that to have these two sons by her. Now, there's one more slide I want to show you real, here real quickly. Uh, to kind of give you a timeline here, if you will, when all of this here happened. Uh, Christ, we'll say it at 0 B.C. Probably it's more like 3 or 4 B.C., but Christ born at 0 B.C. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph probably lived about 2,000 years before Christ. About 500 years after them, we'll see that at the end of our lessons here on Joseph. You're going to have a man by the name of Moses and then Exodus. The Exodus that has taken them out of, out of Egypt. And then, of course, Joshua. We studied the book of Joshua a couple of years ago, the conquest of the land. About 500 years later than that, around 1000 B.C., you're going to have the birth of David and his son Solomon. About 500 years after that, you're going to have the prophets, the major and minor prophets, Isaiah and then Daniel, Jeremiah, and, of course, that prophet Elijah, and then eventually the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, that's who Joseph was. There's kind of your history lesson this morning. What happened in Joseph's life that makes it so significant? Well, I'm going to kind of give you, we're going to go through a quick survey. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 37. And so we're going to do a quick survey this morning because I'm not, I'm not trying to give you surprises through these messages. I want you to understand fully what is going on here. And so I'm going to take you through a quick survey of his life this morning, just hitting on some passages. And there's, there's probably 10 significant events. And it's going to take more than 10 messages to get through those 10 events. I can tell you that right now. But it's rich, rich stuff. The first thing here that I would say, and Michelle, if you'll bring that up, the first event, major event in Joseph's life was that he was his father's favorite son. Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. Notice what it says. Now Israel, and of course Israel's who? Jacob. Now Jacob, or Israel, loved Joseph more than all his children. Why did he love Joseph more than all the others? Why? Why? Because he loved Rachel. Okay? Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all the ten older brothers, if you will, and actually a sister there, because he, Joseph, was the son, number one, of his old age. So Jacob's kind of mellowed out at this point. And he was a scoundrel. That's what his name actually means, swindler. And so Jacob had really had to go. Before Jacob could become a godly dad, God had to do some work on Jacob's life. So he has the son in his old age here, and he loved him, one, because he has him in his old age, and secondly, I believe he loved him more because Rachel was the woman that he actually really loved. And he made, that is, Jacob made Joseph a coat of many Colors. We're going to study about that tunic in a, in a few weeks from now and the significance of that. Point number two in this about Jacob's or Joseph's life is that he had the supernatural ability to interpret dreams. Look at verse 5 here of Genesis 37. It says, And Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it his brethren and they hated him yet the more. Now you probably, you know what the dream is. He had two or three dreams and they were actually prophetic revelations, dreams given to him by God of what was going to happen in the future. But I don't know this, but probably Joseph was a little bit cocky and he kind of showed off in front of his brothers. And so when he goes telling them, listen guys, not only is he coming out here in this, you know, in the flowing multicolored tunic robe here showing off while they're in work clothes. Not only is he doing that, but then he's flaunting over them that eventually he's going to be in a position, and that was going to happen. 
but God had to trim him back a little bit, I think, in this. But God gave him the supernatural ability to interpret what I would call God-given dreams. And I'm using words carefully there. Be careful just because you have a dream. Be careful determining that that dream is from God. God did reveal himself through dreams in the Bible, but it was on very rare occasions. There's probably a half a dozen times in all the Bible, a dozen at the most in thousands of years of history. A lot of the dreams we have is because what we ate before we went to bed, okay? And it's what's in our subconscious and things like that. So be careful of thinking that, you're, that you've got a revelation from God or that you have got a God-given interpretation of that dream. This was something special in Joseph's life here. Point number three is this. He was envied and hated by his brothers. Look back up at verse four here in Genesis 37. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Remember, they're only at the best half brothers and some of them have been born by a servant woman. And so they're dealing with all of this. They're dealing with their father's rejection. The cold shoulder from dad because dad really didn't love them because dad never really loved their mother. And so they're struggling with this and then he comes out here strutting in this garment that his dad's made, which actually was a, well, I don't want to tell you, that's in another message, what even that robe actually represented. And the Bible says they hated him. They got to a point where they, they couldn't even speak to their own half-brother. A fourth thing that's going to happen in his life is that eventually, this is a major episode, he's going to be sold into slavery by his brothers. Verse 23 of Genesis 37. And it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, that multicolor tunic, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and they cast him in a pit. And the pit was empty and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread. And they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah, which is one of the older brothers, said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother and our flesh, guys. And his brethren were content, not because they loved Joseph, but to get the money. Verse 28, then there passed by Midianites, merchant men, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver and brought Joseph into Egypt. Point number five in his life, he's now going to be falsely accused and spend time in prison. Go to Genesis chapter 39. We're going to jump ahead in the story here about him. Genesis chapter 39 verse 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, some believe that he was actually the chief of the executioners, a rough dude. Captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him out of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. While he's there, the Bible says that God's hand is going to be upon Joseph. We're going to see that many times. God is going to bless Joseph in the middle of his tragedy. And so as he's working in the house one day, what happens to Joseph? Potiphar's wife begins to get the eye for Joseph. Joseph, well, and when he went down, he was 17. And he's at best maybe 20 years old, if he's even that. Yet the Bible says he was a nice-looking young man. He was well-built, athletically built. And she began to lust after him and try to seduce him. And to, and to go into bed with her. Verse 7 here of Genesis 39. And it came to pass after these things that his master, master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house. In other words, he doesn't watch over my shoulder. And he hath committed all that he hath in my hand. And she called him, verse 12, by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Verse 19, and it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant say to me that his wrath was kindled. What did she tell the, her husband when he got home that day? This slave that you bought tried to molest me. 
She made up a lie because she'd been rejected. She made up a lie about Joseph. And of course, normally, verse 19, his wrath was kindled. He was angry. He's chief of the executioners. It's only the hand of God. He didn't kill Joseph right there in the house that day. Verse 20, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison in a place where the king's prisoners were bound and he was there in prison. Probably the reason he didn't kill Joseph because he knew his wife. The next principle, God was with Joseph, though, in every circumstance. Genesis chapter 39, verse 21. But the Lord, Jehovah there, was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the, keeper, in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand and all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever he did there, he was the doer of it. And the keeper of the of the prison, look not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with Joseph and that which he did and the Lord made it to prosper. Here's a huge, huge principle that we're going to see in this study. Just because you're in a difficult situation does not mean God's hand is off of you. It may mean that God has placed you in a particular situation to use you in a significant way in that situation. When life gets difficult for you. I used to think this. I used to, when I wanted to do something and I would pray to God and, and the door would not seem to open for me and I used to get frustrated and I used to think, God, you're against me and I would get mad at God. What I have learned through the years is that a closed door does not mean that God is against me. It means that God is for me and he's got one specific door that he wants me to go through and he will not be content for me to go through other doors. A total different perspective. The Bible says that the Lord Jehovah was with Joseph and he made him to prosper. Whatever, the prison house, Joseph's still prospering. Next principle, he was promoted eventually to second in command over all of Egypt. He was in prison for several years there. At one point, we're going to see this in the study, at one time Joseph thinks he's going to get out. He sees a glimmer of hope thinking that maybe he's going to be rescued from the prison and yet he still has to spend two more years in the prison, even after he thinks he has this opportunity to get out. Why would God do this? Genesis chapter 41, verse 1. Why did Joseph still have to wait two more years? It came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed. You all know something? I was praying for a church long before you were looking for a pastor. Probably four or five years before you were ever looking for a pastor, I was begging God for a church. And times I thought God was against me and I was upset. Why? And now I know why. Because I'm home. You know? God brought me where he wanted me. Isn't God good? You know, we don't, we don't see that sometimes. Maybe you're in the middle of a situation right now and you're frustrated. Maybe you feel like you're in a prison right now and you're frustrated and you don't understand why. Brethren, when you can't trace God's hand, trust his heart and know that he's, he's for you. If God be for you, who can be against you? You say, well, how do I know God is for me? He gave his son to die for your sons. He's already paid the greatest price, purchased you with his own blood just so that you could be his child. That's love. And that's what God, we're going to see that through all the study. That's going to be a good study, isn't it? Verse 14 of Genesis 41, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon and Joseph shaved himself and changed his raiment and came unto Pharaoh and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream and there is none that can interpret, interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. Notice what Joseph says in verse 16. Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not of me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Verse 38. Pharaoh said unto his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled only in the throne while I be greater than thou. Second in command of all of it, the most powerful nation in all the earth. When things looked like the doors were closed and they was going nowhere, God was saying, hang on, Joseph, I have got such a position for you, you can't imagine what I want to do. If you'll just... Stick with me. 
Don't rebel against me. Don't get angry at me. Don't pout against me is what God would say to us. Trust me. Look to me. Lean on me. Let me guide you. The next principle we're going to study is that he's going to eventually, he's going to forgive his brothers. Genesis 42. While, while this was going on in Egypt, God was still working back in the house of Jacob. Verse 40, chapter 42, verse 1, when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, there's a famine going on, Jacob said unto his sons, why do you look one to another? You know what, I, I have to interject this. You know what I probably said? You boys enjoy being hungry? Probably the way he said it to them. Why are you standing around doing nothing? Guys, you are worthless sons. And he said, behold, I have heard that there's corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence that we may live and not die. And Joseph's 10 brothers went down to buy corn. Genesis chapter 45. They're going to have an encounter with Joseph. There's going to be a lot of several messages learning about this reconciliation and how it was brought about in this family. Verse 1 of Genesis 45, Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them, that is his brothers, that stood by him. And he cried, caused every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brother, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? It's 17 years later, folks. And his brethren could not, 13 years later, excuse me. And his brothers could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. Verse 4, and Joseph said unto his brethren, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Notice verse 5. Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. The next principle we're going to study is going to be how that God actually used Joseph to provide for his family. Verse 9 of Genesis 45. Haste ye and come up, go up to my father and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord over all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. So he's going to, the brother are going to go back and they're going to get Jacob, their father, and the rest of their family. And they're going to bring them all down into Egypt. And the last principle that we'll touch on at the very end of all of this is that actually Jacob, or Joseph, excuse me, is the reason the children of Israel became slaves in Egypt. It's not his fault that they became slaves, but look at Exodus chapter 1. The life of Joseph actually goes into the next book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 1. and verse 6, it says, And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation, old, old men, now in Egypt. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty and the land was filled with them. That is Egypt. They went from 60 some people to over a million in population during that time in Egypt. Verse 8, And there arose a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, so get them out of the land. Therefore the Egyptians did set over the Israelites taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramesses. Now, let me bring this first lesson message to a conclusion. Why should we study Joseph's life? You know, I remember one time I was teaching out of the Old Testament in Ohio, and this man said to me, you know, Pastor, if I were you, I'd just preach out of the New Testament. That Old Testament's just old stuff. And I thought, you don't understand. The Old Testament puts flesh on the principles of the New Testament. It's the same God. He never changes. And so we're going to see principles that we're going to see in the New Testament, we're going to interweave those back into the Old Testament and through the life of Joseph. We're going to see a lot of things. We're going to see pride, jealousy, anger, lust. We're also going to see humility, forgiveness, and the grace of God. But here's probably the great thing that we're going to learn from this. Paul tells something in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according unto His purpose. It does not say all things are good. 
It does not say all things are pleasant. But it says God is able to take even the unpleasant. God is able to take even slavery and prison and interweave it in together and bring something good for those who determine to love God and live according to His purpose. Look at Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Many say here's the key verse in the entire study of the life of Joseph. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Joseph says, But as for you, you thought evil against me, saying to his brothers, but God meant it for good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. This I believe that even if evil happens to me, if I keep my focus on God and walk with God, God is able to use even that for a good purpose. That's what Romans 8.28 teaches. Because God loves me and God's in control. It says in Isaiah chapter 46 verse 10 about God, declaring the end from the beginning. So when, when does God going to figure out what's going to happen? When does, does, does something happen today and God I, I never thought that would happen. I used to have a friend that say, did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? Declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. The Bible says that God chose me and he has ordained me to bear much fruit. And by bearing much fruit through my life, God is glorified. Therefore, if God be for me, who can be against me? Because God's got it already. He already understands what's going to happen in my life. You know, if Genesis 50, 20 is the, the key verse, I think Genesis chapter 39, verse 2 follows right along with it. Here it says, Jehovah was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man. Whatever it is he did, circumstances did not determine whether or not he'd be a prosperous man. His relationship with God is what determined it. God is able to cause a man to prosper even in prison because it's God. It's all of the hand of God. I've read this before that the difficulties in our life can either make us bitter or they can make us better. Unfortunately, for a lot of people, difficulty makes them bitter. And so therefore, then they have to go through more difficulty. They rebel against God. They get angry against God. And so therefore, the Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he what? He chasteneth. If you're a child of God and you get out of his will, I want to tell you something. He's going to get you back in his will. Because he loves you. He is not content for you to be out of his will. Physically, most of all, spiritually. And so he's going to, the best thing you and I can do is to walk in his will as much as possible. And for Joseph, those circumstances could have made him bitter, but it made him better. He looked to God. He trusted in God. And God had a plan. He didn't understand the plan. You know, now we can read the life of Joseph and we can look back and we could see that you think, well, sure, yeah, if God would do that for me. He didn't know that. As far as he knew that he had spent the rest of his life in prison. As far as he knew, he could have thought, if he thought just as we think many times when Potiphar's wife was seducing him, he could have thought, you know, I'll never go back home. I'll never see my dad again. Nobody knows me. What difference does it make? But you know what he said? He said, I cannot do this evil, not only to my master, but he says, I cannot do this evil before God. I cannot do this evil. He had such a relationship with God that he knew that even when no one else was looking at him, watching him, God was watching him. And because of that, he was a prosperous man.